was back in 2004. At the time, the blog scene was very new, right? It was like this idea that uh, the blogs are going to change journalism, are going to revolutionize the new media and all that. So I was really interested in about how information actually spreads within that particular context, within the context of blog space, within the blogosphere. Because it was a very new domain and it was a lot easier to track uh, how information spreads within blogs. Because this has been actually, on a side note, has been a huge interest for social sciences for a long period of time. Understand the phenomenon of word of mouth, how information spreads across individuals. But given the internet and the blogosphere, it becomes a lot easier to track how those memes, those bits of information would spread. Uh, and that was the emphasis of my thesis, my, my graduate thesis, was blog viz, understanding, visualizing how information spreads again uh, across, uh, um, across different blogs. And then, because I was so interested in that, I had to understand how people were actually visualizing networks, the underlying network of the World Wide Web, the internet, and so on. So that led finally to the, this emphasis, this passion for network visualization. I started collecting a bunch of examples, not just of the World Wide Web, of blogosphere, but also a variety of other types of networks, from food networks, social networks, to biological networks, gene networks, transportation networks, computer networks, like everything you can think of that resembles some type of a network I was collecting. And that ultimately was also the foundational work for uh, the website visualcomplexity.com. I showed an image of uh, the internet. Well, the not we, sh we should be clear about what we mean by that. So it, it is a visualization of a given number of servers that constitutes the internet, right? The backbone of the internet. And Actually, one of the first books that I've witnessed, and that was a major influence on, on my, my growth and my interest for visualization, in particular network visualization, was the Atlas of Cyberspace. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that book, but I highly recommend it. It's actually it's getting harder to find it because this was probably published uh, definitely more than 10 years ago, uh, maybe 15 years ago or something, if not more. And it was a major reference. It was the first book that actually provided this atlas of the internet of anything. So you had visualizations on the early steps of the blog space, of servers, of uh, different IP addresses and all that. So it was the first sort of compendium on mapping this un unexplored territory, right? It was almost like the first atlas of the Americas, right? It was like a, a whole new world that was being uncovered uh, by all these explorers trying to visualize different aspects of the internet, of the backbone, the infrastructure of the internet. And it is also the discussions that were happening online. Uh, and I think that was a major influence for, for myself. But even when you look at that book, or even when you look at many of the maps that happened after that book was published, mapping different aspects again of, of the internet, what I was trying to say yesterday, and I only showed one, but even in the Places and Spaces exhibit, you probably have a few more, if not actually a few more dozen ones. I was trying to say that many people look at a map like this as in the same vein as people looked at the first map of the Americas thinking this is the way that America looks, right? This is the way that the internet looks. And of course that, that's not the case as any map, map, any single map is always one possible angle of many others uh, as a way of interpreting that subject, in, in particular that territory, right? So when we look at any given map, in particular maps of the internet, we have to be cautious about taking too many insights from that map in the sense that this is just one of many possible angles. And I did that by illustrating, as you probably remember, uh, this beautiful painting, The Wave of Kanagawa, uh, that illustrates Mount Fuji, uh, seeing within waves and a fisherman sort of struggle with the sea. But then that map, that painting actually is part of a set of paintings depicting Mount Fuji from a variety of different places, from Mount Fuji seen from the mountains, from the cities, from the, 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 the plains, etc. So it is it provides us with this sort of holistic view into Mount Fuji. And the analogy there is the following. In the same way as Mount Fuji can be represented from a variety of different places and angles, it's the same thing with the data set. It's the same thing with the internet in this particular case. It really depends on the viewpoint that you're looking at. But there are many viewpoints you could, you could take. But I think one of the challenges definitely of mapping really highly complex systems, and I think I got into that a little bit in the end of the talk, was in regards to the limitations of technology. 
I think that's one of the key limitations. I think in many ways technology uh, and you know a lot of the computers we have uh, hasn't really caught up to the challenges we are facing in terms of visualizing large complex data sets, specifically when it comes to network networks and, and network visualization. Uh, because then the, the, the challenge is extremely complex, it's extremely challenging to, to do anything in that field that's really relevant for understanding. Uh, so again, we are so limited by the size of our screen, by, you know, by the limitations of our mouse and all that. So I think we, again, technology really needs to catch up uh, in many different ways. And a lot of the, the interesting explorations that I've seen when it comes to visualizing really complex data sets is when you have sort of multi-sensorial, multi-touch, type of immersive environments, much larger than, than the ones you have uh, confined by the screen of your, of your laptop. Those are things tend to be the most promising sort of aspects for, for the future of visualization. Um, I think you're totally right. I think the places and spaces exhibit is something that we should all appreciate because we don't even understand how relevant that's going to be for future generations. So at least we are guaranteeing that some of those important cultural artifacts, many of the maps and visualization people are producing nowadays, which in many ways reflects our current interests, right? What's happening in politics, what's happening in culture and society. All of those are being sort of conveyed through many of the visualizations you have in this exhibit. So and that's an important sort of reflection on how society thinks nowadays in this moment in time. And a lot of those projects, as you're saying, are going to be what well, actually being lost as we speak. Uh, so Places and, and Spaces Exhibit is a great way of preserving a lot of these projects for the future. And so is, I hope, it is the, the emphasis that I did on my first book, Visual Complexity, even on my second one. Uh, I feel, apart from all the other goals that I'm aiming to achieve with those, with those books, um, I think one of the most critical ones is definitely preserving a lot of these projects for the future, for future generations, so they can really understand what's happening. I think it has been a great concern of mine, I don't know if you're familiar with the term, the digital dark ages, but I think it's actually a really interesting concept. Uh, you can actually look for it online, but it is an idea that we might, at some point in the future, we're going to look back at the current time and not be able to decode or understand any of the cultural artifacts, the digital cultural artifacts we're producing. And for me, that's a really scary prospect, right? So we've, we've gone through a dark ages and we know how frustrating that was for historians, right? And it's still, in many ways, kind of puzzling what happened then. So imagine as civilization evolves, as we become more sophisticated, more advanced, and at the same time, we, we are almost like ne leaving no traces behind, right? And that's a really scary prospect. As you were mentioning, it was a lot easier for me to get an image from medieval Europe, from, let's say, uh, 1500s, than it was to get an, an image of a visualization of the internet created in 2000, right? The plugins get vanished, uh, the code is outdated. Even the only images that they have done, like say back in 98, 1998, are so small resolution-wise that not even able to print it, right? So you have like all these inherent problems of of being obsessed with this g digital uh, medium that we don't realize how ephemeral it is, and someone needs to be, you know, worrying about these issues because these are really serious issues. That feeling of like being overwhelmed with new data and new information is actually not entirely novel. We have been through that process actually a few times in the past. Like even in the you have like texts from from the 19th century, for for instance, that they had the same sense of like being overwhelmed with all this information that was coming from from different separate areas of the globe. Like in the in medieval times, they had when they discovered the Americas and all that, there was like a huge avalanche of new information coming, like species that they were not aware that existed around the world. So there's very different periods in time where this new avalanche and of course even going back to like 800 years ago you had Europe was inundated literally inundated by all this new knowledge coming from the ancient world from ancient Greece and ancient Rome so and and there's numerous uh, texts detailing people uh, the feeling that you're talking about exactly the same feelings that people were sort of overwhelmed by all this new information they had to find ways of organizing this new new material and so on so it's not entirely new, like I think almost like every other generation feels that sense of being overwhelmed by new material and new, new data. Of course by far, maybe now, because we are just creating new data at just a separate, such a rapid, a rapid pace,
that we've never done it in the past, right? So it is somehow unique because of that. It's also unique um, because of the the digital nature of a lot of the material we're creating, which, as you were saying, is a lot more accessible around the world, 24/7, right? Uh, I think what what hopefully I don't want it to happen is that through this envelope of information and data, uh, for instance, like I, I can go back if I think of when I was back in school, right? When I was studying, um, I didn't have access. I mean, internet was a very sort of new thing. And of all the websites you had, it was not a very accessible, it didn't have a lot of information. Wikipedia didn't exist back then. So a lot of the things we take for granted now, you students, you guys take for granted now, didn't happen like 10 years ago, right? Uh, you don't have to go that further back. Uh, I think one of the, the things that could be slightly pernicious about the whole process is due to this huge avalanche and accessibility to all this material, all this information, people become numb to it, right? They become sort of blind to the process. It's just too much for you to handle. So I prefer to just step back and just do my own thing. And that's a pro problem, I feel, with this new avalanche of data. And I think this is perhaps where I truly believe visualization can come into place as a big filter into this rain of data, right? Because it's so easy for us to become numb and just, you know, close our eyes and just forget about everything we're seeing and looking and hearing and all that because it's literally too much unless we actually find a very relevant filter a filter based on what's most relevant to us what's more effective for us to process and so on because I actually in other talks I, I give this example that the storage the storage capability that we have going in you know iPods and and all this sort of digital uh, products in laptops and so on keeps on increasing. It actually uh, increases on a very rapid pace. And I think some, according to some projections, by the year 2020 um, or the year 2025, we're going to be able to, to um, store in one single laptop the equivalent of one petabyte of data. That's the equivalent of like the entire Library of Congress in your laptop, right? All of humanity's knowledge in your laptop. And then the challenge is not getting there. We know we're going to get there. We know in terms of storing this, 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 all this material, all this data, it's going to be fairly easy for us. It's just a matter of time. But then the challenge becomes, what are you going to do with all that data, right? What are the filters we're going to have to create for users to be able to make sense of that large quantities of data? And I think one of the critical filters would have to be visualization uh, as a sort of the tool for understanding. There's a great uh, design, universal design principle, which is the flexibility versus usability trade-off, right? Mm -hmm. As the flexibility of a system increases, let's say that you have like all these features in the phone, the usability tends to decrease, right? right? Because there's too many things. It's the paradox of choice. There's too many options to click from. And I think it, it happens the same process with the example you're giving. Like, I probably can do oh, so many things, but it's hard to search. Instead of just being not as flexible as a D, as a as a as a as a, as a CD. But that's it, you know, like it's very usable. You know exactly what you meant to do and you know exactly what you're going to get from that process. So there is a bit of that sort of challenge and it's a really hard balance to sort of strike between flexibility and usability. Effort on preserving art tends to be a lot stronger than on preserving a lot of the, the scientific sort of, uh, you know, a lot of the visualizations you see, for instance. Um, I don't know exactly why, uh, well, especially now, given the digital sort of um, environment that we live in, a lot of the pieces that I showed actually tend up to be uh, ima tend to be sort of paintings and sculptures and so on. And I think that gives a little bit more legit legitimacy into the product, into the sort of the, this movement, this community. Uh, but it's also, yeah, it, it is also a sign that networks are becoming more than just a scientific distraction more than just a scientific sort of interest, right? Uh, and I feel it's really interesting to see how many artists, traditional artists themselves, painters and sculptors, are becoming almost driven by the same sort of force that's driving many scientists from uh, complexity science and, and network science in terms of decoding a lot of these complex systems, in terms of finding sort of the nuances that underlie a lot of these uh, complex subjects. If you look at the history of art, or history of art, they are always like the first ones to pick on like you know social change, on massive social cha changes and cultural changes and so on. I think here's another example that they are almost like foreseeing the importance of this network thinking.
I mean, I think that's what I sort of try to uh, say a lot in my first book, In Visual Complexity. Really, I like the importance, if anything else, that's I think the one thing that I hope people get from the book, which is the importance of looking at the world around us from a network point of view. A network point of view being and being that, you know, everything, or almost everything, is interdependent, it's interrelated, it's interconnected. And it's only by that process, understanding that all this sort of large network of things exists, then we're going to be able to solve a lot of the problems we have nowadays, from understanding the human brain to understanding how cities operate, understanding the ecosystems that abound our planet. Like, all those problems are immensely complex, mostly because they are all interdependent and all interconnected. There's a lot of elements that play a role into this, a lot of these processes. So it is only through network thinking they're going to be able to sort of understand them and, and hopefully resolve them for, for the future.